Hey everybody, it's me again. I know it's been a long time, but I figured we'd have uh, sort of an interesting and special video today. Um, this is not really going to be talking about the decent quite as much, but we'll certainly be using it to show off a couple of things. Um, and maybe, you know, if you want, I can do a another video ab about this, um, if I can get back into to doing this. These just take a long time, and uh, I have a pretty busy life. So anyhow, uh, I'll give you the quick uh, TLDR on the decent machine. So it's been almost two years since I've had this. It'll be two years in March. And um, to put it simply, it has been perfect. I haven't had any issues with it whatsoever. It pumps out shots consistently and, and wonderfully. Um, decent has been great with support and updates and the community itself has been uh, fantastic as well. Uh, but what we're here to talk about today uh, is it's probably time to say goodbye. So if you notice here on the left of my machine, I'm looking at two very different grinders from two very different price points, two very different capabilities. Um, the SETI 270W, which I've had for almost as long as the Decent, about two years uh, at this point. Uh, and now my, my brand new, just arrived Eureka uh, Atom 75. So here we have a 43 millimeter cone burr on the SETI 270. Uh, and then on the, the right hand side here with the, the Eureka Atom 75 with of course the 75 millimeter flat burr. So two very different price points, about $500 here to $1,300 or $1,400 there. Um, obviously they're kind of in different leagues, but um, I want to talk about why we're, we're moving on, um, pros and cons, and let's talk about that. So the SETI 270W, this guy, like I said, I've had it for almost two years and when it is working, it is a fantastic grinder. I think it punches well above its price class. It um, puts out a very consistent grind. It's very fast, uh, especially for its size and power level. Um, it hits my weights almost perfectly every single time, and I don't have the upgraded Intelligent WI. Uh, I, I didn't even bother spending the, the $35 to update that. Um, but if you heard what I said, I said when it is working, it works fantastically. So I had problems with this grinder really from day one and credit to Baratza, right? So this is my fourth Baratza grinder over my, my lifetime, um, from an Encore or to a, from a Maestro to an Encore Plus to a Virtuoso Preciso now onto the Tet SETI 270. Um, I've certainly had my fair share of Baratzas. There's customer support is unparalleled. I've never had an issue. Um, but as much as I, I love their grinders because they, they definitely stand behind them and they're all very repairable. These are not disposable. To me, it's just they lack the reliability that I'm looking for uh, for the day in and day out. So to kind of start with what I had issues with with the SETI from the very start was I used to use this porter filter hook down here and this part down, down here on the bottom on the scale part of things uh, originally was made out of plastic. And I think it was the very first day that I had the grinder. I, I moved the fork out of the way. That piece of plastic cracked uh, and that part no longer worked. Baratza actually replaced the grinder entirely because they had updated that part to metal already. So never had that issue ever again, of course. Um, but then shortly after that, uh, the problems began to occur with the micro adjust collar down here in the bottom. So the, the part where I, I adjust the kind of stepless area for, for micro adjustment would begin wandering while I was grinding coffee. And that was a nuisance, of course, because when it did that, it meant I lost my grind setting. It meant my grind drifted in the middle of a, a grind, which is certainly not good. So I either began having to put my finger on it, or I would either move it all the way to coarse or all the way to fine, which at that point it wouldn't walk for me. But of course that limited my adjustment quite significantly. So through email and support with Barraza, um, we tried a number of fixes, including a, a paper clip in the grind adjustment area. Uh, they replaced the felt for me. Um, and of course, there's a problem under underlying this grinder for why this is the reason, and I'll show you that in one second. And here it is. This is the inside of the old grinder assembly. Um, and you can see that down in inside of there is our best friend plastic. So this part on the bottom, which is the micro adjust collar, screws into plastic. It's very easy to over tighten this if you're trying to get it to stop drifting, which then strips the plastic and then it's very loose and this no longer works. 
So to compensate for that, if I were to open this up, you'd see that there is a, a ring of felt inside of here that uh, is waxed, which creates friction. Um, that's kind of their solution to the problem is to kind of stuff that joint with uh, a friction material. I just don't believe it works particularly well. Um, if this was maybe a reinforced nylon or some other type of material in here besides the plastic, um, then this collar might be held on a bit better. But um, in essence, that was the, the, the issue with that. Now, Brazzo was, of course, generous enough to replace this entire part for me after, after I'd had so many issues with it. Um, but the very day that I was supposed to receive the new collar, the grinder died entirely. So let's take a look at that. So here, what are we looking at right here? Well, this is the heart of the 270W right here. This is the 290 watt or 270 watt DC motor that is part of that. And then down here, what we see is the actual gearbox assembly that makes this grinder go. So this part is the, the pinion gear that is attached directly to the motor. And you can see that it is completely destroyed. This plastic has, has melted and basically just torn itself apart. This mates with this part of the, the gearbox here, and you can just see everything inside this plastic gearbox is basically just shredded. There's piled up bits of, of melted plastic and, and uh, grease in there that has attempted to keep this thing together. Um, I can also see that there's bearing races on here. If I take this apart, these bearing races are are just basically fried. Now, after, after about a year and a half of use, or close to closer to two years, I suppose, um, you know, this one race is even even split and broken. Um, this gearbox just kind of gave up the ghost. It it no longer is functional, and of course, the gearbox actually contains the contains the ring burr up here. Now, the burr is still in fantastic condition. There's nothing nothing wrong with the burrs at this point. Um, but Barazza sent me an entirely new motor and gearbox assembly, which is in the grinder now. So now ostensibly, this is a brand new grinder. I have a new adjustment ring and a new gearbox and motor. Uh, so at this point, really, there's nothing much else in the grinder that, um, you know, would ever need to be replaced. The scale mechanism, I don't think, is really something that's a wear part. Uh, and of course, the screen itself is um, going to do what it's going to do. So uh, I basically have a new grinder now, but, you know, this is one of those things where it's, it's, uh, it's apparent that... Um, from a perspective of build, this is ne not necessarily a long-term part. So for me, I'm doing about three to four shots of espresso five or six days per week, right? So that's, and, and a couple of those go into a latte uh, or whatever. So it's, it's a very low duty grinder, um, certainly far less than the 10% duty that uh, Barazza recommends for this particular grinder type. So for me, last thing, you know, year and a half, close to two years um, before this part inevitably is going to give out. I, I don't see, I honestly don't foresee how this won't happen with literally everybody's grinder if they're using it for espresso. It's it's just a, a fact of the, the physics and materials that are involved here. The nice part, of course, is that um, you can purchase these replacement parts from Barazza. They even, you know, they give you a sticker over here. Don't dump it, fix it, which is great. And I, and I, you know, I, I found that with older Barazza grinders, the other ones that I've had as well. Um, you know, my, my Virtuoso Preciso is a, a good example of that where, um, it has sort of a sacrificial burr holder, which I replaced maybe every five or six months. It was a three or $4 part. It was not a big deal, but of course, every time it went down, the grinder was down. So, uh, I would always have a backup or two sitting in a drawer just in case that were to happen. And that, of course, saved other parts of the grinder. Now, an important thing to note about this. The SETI 270, I think it retails for $549, something like that. Um, and then if even if you send it to Barazza to have the entire thing overhauled so you don't have to do it yourself, uh, that will cost uh, $90 or $85. So you figure with shipping, 100 bucks. And if you do that every two years to overhaul this grinder, it takes a while to get it up to the uh, retail cost of the new guy that I have sitting on the counter, which is that Eureka Atom 75. That Atom 75, of course, goes for about $1,350 or $1,400, a little bit more if you choose to go with the Chrome model. Um, so you figure $100 a year plus $500. Uh, it takes a while to get your return on investment between those two grinders. So the question is, 
reliability of, of the Eureka is unquestioned. I know this is going to last me for a very long time without really me needing to do anything to it. But the question is, is the cup that much better? Because I have been, frankly, very impressed with what the 270 is able to do. Now, it's a big difference between a conical and a flat burr. Um, but what I'll do today is I'll, I'll pull some shots between these two grinders uh, with the same beans. I'm going to be using uh, some Redbird Espresso uh, today. Uh, and I'll, I'll single dose with the exact same coffee so there's no difference in age or anything like that uh, so we can compare between them. And I'm really just curious before some lucky winner, and I mean that by a buyer, uh, will be purchasing this 270 from me because I'll be selling it. Um, so if you're interested in that, certainly let me know. I, I will uh, definitely have this thing for sale. Um, and it's, again, it's been it's been reassembled by yours truly. I will add one more thing about the, the reassembly of all the new parts in this. I used Threadlocker on everything because one of the things that I noticed when I took it apart was because of the vibrations of this grinder, a lot of the screws had actually backed themselves out and there was no real um, engagement of those threads or, or any kind of uh, thread lock to keep them in place. Now they're uh, nice and adjusted um, and it should last you know somebody a good long time now at this point. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll mention about the new parts in this and the new grinder, it is far quieter than it was before it broke. And I don't know if that's sort of the effect of like when you get new tires on a car and suddenly your car is quieter because uh, the tread wear is, is less. But um, that was one of the things that I was, I was very excited for about the Eureka is that the Eureka is known to be a very, very quiet grinder and the SETI will wake up the neighborhood. So uh, they're much closer in sound than uh, they, they certainly were originally. And um, so that's a good thing for Baratza. Anyhow, we'll be back. Okay, so before we get started, I'm just gonna show you the profile that we're going to use. Uh, I'll start off with the Eureka grinder, um, but I'm using uh, a pause profile, essentially, that um, allows for the coffee to bloom in the portafilter a bit before we actually pull the shot. So let me show you what that looks like. So go into settings here, and I will edit this particular profile. So advanced. So on the side, maybe we can see the screen a bit better. Okay, so there's simply four steps to this profile, and I'll kind of walk you through the advanced editor. I, th I think I did a video on this already, but basically the pre-infusion, we're asking for four milliliters of water per second um, at 200 degrees. And I want this a little bit warmer because it's gonna hit colder coffee, and I, I want the temperature to kind of even out there. Um, and then what I'm looking for is basically, I wanna move on to the next step if my pressure indicator reaches 1.6 bar. So that basically means as soon as I start to build any appreciable amount of pressure in the puck, I will stop feeding coffee in here. So typically what, I, what I'll what i usually get is about roughly two to one on the, the grams of coffee to the uh, milliliters of water that are going in there. So it's essentially what I want. I then have this next step, which is named pre-infusion. It's just a name, it's really just a pause. So uh, at this point, I'm starting to lower the temperature, even though there's nothing really happening. You notice I have zero milliliters per second on the flow, uh, and then it's going for 20 seconds. So basically I'm pausing for 20 seconds to allow the, the pre-infused water that we've put in there to wet the puck, to actually kind of evenly um, uh, get everything kind of going and solidify the, the coffee bed. And this, of course, will reduce channeling and um, it does good things. Then I actually have my pour phase. And at this point, I'm, I'm pulling Redbird at 197. I think that's a good temperature for how this, this uh, espresso tastes. I want a flow profile. So now this is kind of going to be the, the great equalizer between these two grinders is flow profiles are definitely more challenging. I'm just asking for 2.2 milliliters per second. So that's the speed that I want coming out of here. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to run that basically for 40 seconds, but I'm going to stop it manually at a two to one ratio. Um, and we'll see, like, I've already kind of dialed in these grinders for getting, you know, between seven and nine bar of pressure so that uh, they're hopefully all things being equal. We'll see how, you know, they taste in the cup. Oh, one thing I didn't mention was this last step, which is just temp reset. And really all it is is an additional step that pump, bumps the temperature back up to 200 degrees. The reason we do this uh, is more so when the, the coffee machine goes back into uh, kind of waiting mode, it, it ramps the temperature back up to 200 degrees so it's ready for the next shot because that's our starting temperature. So. Um, you could always start it hotter or, or whatever you want to do, but but uh, it's nice to do that. Otherwise, it would remain at the 197 pole temperature, which you know, three degrees may not make a giant difference, but um, it certainly does in the cup. So a little bit about Redbird coffee too while we're getting started. So Redbird is a all uh, Arabica blend. Um, 
people say it's a darker roasted espresso, but I mean, to me looking at it, it's, it's probably, uh, um, maybe it's a full city. You can still see some, uh, some wrinkling on the, the skins of that, that coffee. Not a lot of chaff left in the channels of the beans. So it's definitely kind of gone, um, closer to second crack, but I would definitely not call this a dark roasted coffee by any stretch. I happen to like it uh, quite a bit um, because for me, it hits the notes that I want for espresso. I typically look for kind of those those base notes. Like I like the cocoa flavor. I like the nutty flavors. Um, I don't like it when an espresso tastes overly jammy and fruity. Uh, so that's just my personal preference. Um, those types of coffees that, that have that uh, those characteristics, I like those more with milk. Uh, so for me, for straight espresso, I kind of like it to be closer to a true Italian profile, not quite as as bitter, but um, in that realm. So that's why we're doing this coffee. It's also very forgiving, so it, it should actually um, uh, be a, a nice comparison between these two grinders. Quick note about glassware. Uh, as well while we're at it. So I'm going to be pulling shots into these Bodum double walled uh, glasses here for a couple of reasons. One, um, they're preheated with very hot water, so uh, they will hold their temperature and the, the vacuum double wall keeps the espresso really nice and hot um, the whole time. So I'll taste each shot after I, after I make it, but I'm hoping to be able to compare the two without the one cooling off significantly. Uh, I will be stirring them. Thank you, James Hoffman. Um, I, I do think they taste better when stirred, so stir them with their own spoons. And I also have some seltzer here to kind of cleanse my palate uh, between tasting. So try to keep this as, uh, you know, fair as possible between the two. Okay, first up is going to be the SETI. 18.1 um, <clears throat> uh, grams going in, close enough. Single dose. And press play. Got about 17.9-ish grams out there. I think a bean or two sits on top of the cone burr up on top and uh, hides out. So there we are. Just to give you an idea of the grind quality from the SETI, I'm not going to do the whole spread it out on paper and look for fines and all that fun stuff. But the SETI puts out a very nice, fluffy, clump-free grind, which I did very much like for sure. Um, I use a decent funnel, and I just kind of uh, shake it up in that, that cup, pour it through the funnel, um, tap it around just to get it nice and even. And I'm going to use a leveler uh, as my tamper uh, for both of these, so it'll be very consistent. Okay, we got 18 grams in. We were zeroed out and hit the start. Okay, so what's happening here is we kind of have a, a quick final heating stage before the pre-infuse happens. You can see the temperatures up in the upper left there. Uh, our goal, again, is 200 for that pre-infuse. There we go. Now we're pumping four mils of water per second through there until my pressure reaches a little bit higher. That's the green line. So once it starts to tick up, we stop. And now if you see kind of on this uh, reflection there on my screen, there's no coffee coming out of the portafilter at this point. I'll try to get a nice, nice shot of this as we start extraction here. This wind out of the way. You can see it actually is starting to build as it's pre-infusing. And now here comes our together now. A little gushy. Okay, so interestingly enough, this shot up to 11 bar, where the previous shot that I just dialed this this guy in went, went uh, only to 9, so that's troublesome at first. Looking for that 30, I'm going to stop at about 35 grams. stopped on its own because it took too long. So I should probably extend that a little bit. I'm going to run another one of these guys. But if I take a look at my pressure profile on this one, so basically what happened here is look at the blue line. That's our flow rate. So we did our pre-infusion. We stopped and we waited. And then uh, as we, we pulled our actual shot, the pressure ramped up to close to 11 bars. And you can notice that actually the flow went down at that point because um, that's about the, the, that's a cutoff for the machine. The machine will actually stop pushing flow because it doesn't want to overpressurize anything. And then it kind of calmed down as the puck started to erode. 
uh, and then we flattened out. And here's our shot itself. You can see the kind of clip, the cup is a bit spattered because of that high pressure. I'd, I'd like to see it lower than that. So we're going to actually do this shot over uh, with a slightly coarser grind on the SETI because I want things to be close. Okay, we've coarsened up the grind just a little bit. So 18 grams in, 18 grams out of the grinder. And uh, here we go again. Attempt number two with the SETI 270W. Here's our pre infuse. Hit our pressure. You can see in that mirror, there's nothing kind of coming out yet. Now, while it's doing this, there's a FYI. I, uh, previous to this video, I did a pretty deep cleaning of the diesel machine as well, so it is fresh as a daisy. So shouldn't be any any flaws coming from that. Okay, I can see it starting to build. Still a bit high on that pressure, but not quite as much. So I probably could go a little bit coarser. I don't hate it though. Try to get 36-ish, perfect, okay. So looking back at that graph before I taste, you can see I peaked a, a bit over 10 on pressure and my flow definitely dropped just a bit because of that to to, uh, to make sure that it didn't overpress, but it's not bad. So let's, let's give it a taste. Okay. So I tasted it. I didn't love it. It's definitely a bit harsh. Um, maybe a bit bitter, I suppose. Uh, I, I definitely have tasted this coffee in a better light. So I'm not going to to score uh, the study on that one just yet, but here's something, an example that I don't love about the setting necessarily. So I've now just coarsened up this micro adjust now to all the way to the coarsest setting on the, this particular step because um, that's basically what I needed to do to, to go coarser. What I don't want to do is move the macro adjust just coarser, which I'm, I may have to depending upon what this shot comes out to be. Because once I move that one and I and then I turn this wheel finer, I believe there's an overlap between the macro and the micro. So it just makes it that much harder to dial in if you're between steps. It's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, so hopefully this is the right... Uh, the right dial and we'll see. So back in a minute. You can see as the coffee, as the water kind of infuses throughout that puck, you can see it starting to come out of the the bottom of the, the basket. By the way, it's a 15 gram decent basket with 18 grams of coffee. This is a V1 machine, so I have a lot of headspace, so I like using the, the smaller baskets. I'll tell you what, that looks better from a your over pressure perspective, but look at where we're at now. So we're, we're chasing this at just five bars. But what I've noticed is this is really what I want. It's a little over on that, but I'm going to keep it. So I'm chasing my pressure around a little bit from, you know, I, I literally moved it two micro letters on the SETI and I went from, you know, nine, 10 bars of pressure to five. There's a there's a, quite a bit of, of uh, uh, difference between those two, but there's really not that much of a difference in the cup between five bar, 10 bar. It, it's it's just one of those things that it, it swings pretty wildly. So I actually like the way that pulled. It was nice and smooth, no spatter, uh, really good looking shot of espresso. So I'm gonna give this a taste and then we'll switch over to the uh, the Eureka. Otherwise I'm gonna be here all day and I get very, very caffeinated. Okay, big boy time, 18 grams. I'll throw this in the Eureka now. TV magic, I needed to plug this grinder in. Okay, so we're gonna go manual mode on this because we're just grinding single dose. Off we go. It is definitely quieter than the SETI, for sure. I'm hoping to get as much of it out as I can. This is gonna take a little longer. Let's call that. All right, let's see how we did from, uh... oh, there you go. So I went in with 18.0, 18.1, and I came out with 17.9. That's, I'm not gonna complain about it. 
Grind quality here as well, by the way, very, very clump free. I would actually probably give the edge to the SETI for fewer clumps maybe, um, but it still comes out really fluffy. And when you grind it directly into the porta filter, um, it, it builds a really nice fluffy mound in the middle. I just think it makes a giant mess on the counter. So um, I don't live in a cafe, so I will probably, I will probably dose into a, a container and, and kind of do it this way with my, my funnel, which keeps things nice and neat. Okay, first go with the Eureka. While this is pulling, um, let me talk about that first shot from, or the last shot from the SETI. So I liked it. This is what I expect out of out of Redbird. Uh, you know, it's it's definitely chocolatey, a little bit of like a, a nutty characteristic from it. Just the right amount of, um, you know, bitterness that, that isn't overpowering. And then even maybe a little bit of... Uh, citric acid, like a, a you know, lemony um, type of finish to it. And it, it kind of lingers on the palate. It's nice. I, I, I enjoy this espresso quite a bit. Okay, so here we are. We're about ready to end our pre-infusion and maybe pay attention to if there's any differences in how the cone forms between these two grinds. Really smoothly got itself to a single cone. And let's watch our, our pressure gauge here. Actually, this is probably a really perfect comparison because it's about the same as the SETI was the last shot, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be okay with that. Try to stop it at the same time frame. We had about 37 out on the SETI, about the same here. Holy crema, Batman. Uh, I don't recall the roast date on this coffee, but it should be a, about a week out. But I think that was a, a really beautiful pull, and, and you can see kind of the cleanliness of the cup there, no splattering. Um, it formed a formed a cone really really easily, whereas this, the the grind from the SETI seemed to take a few streams to to gather itself together. So uh, let's taste it and see if I can notice any real significant differences. Here's the two next to each other, and obviously the one on the right is the Eureka, and so it was pulled more recently, so there's a bit more more crema left on on top. They were both stirred pretty pretty vigorously. There is definitely a difference in taste. So the Eureka lacks, um, it's almost a sour note on the, the steady side of things, which is surprising. They're both pulled at the same temperature and I usually attribute sour to really being a, a temperature difference. Um, whereas the, the, the Eureka pull, that's almost gone. Um, it tastes very coffee-like. Um, neither one of them are bad. They're both pretty good shots. Uh, but I think, I think for me, I think that the flavor on the, the Eureka is rounder. There's sort of less of a, a little bit of a harshness there. Um, I'd be happy with both of them, like I said. Um, but I'd say based on the the pour quality from the Eureka, just the way that it uh, left the porta filter um, and the taste, it definitely has the edge over the SETI. But they're pretty close, and, and that's the you know the the amazing thing about these two grinders is they're they're worlds apart when it comes to price, design, and everything else. Um, but both of them are very capable. I, you know, I, I very much believe in the law of diminishing returns and spending a huge amount of money on um, a piece of equipment for very, very incremental increases in, in performance. It's not really where I want to go. Now, of course, I'm sitting here with a decent on the counter, so it's kind of throwing that in the face. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the Eureka, and I think uh, it's going to be uh, a great addition to the decent on here on the counter. The other thing I want to mention, too, about... The Eureka is the is the grind adjustment up here. It's super precise. It's super tight. I can adjust it very minutely and very easily. Um, and there's no macro mi macro micro kind of thing to, to futz around with. Uh, and I think I'm gonna like that quite a bit more for dialing in copies than the combo of the macro micro on the setting. Not that there's you know that that it's terrible, um, but if you switch between coffee types like I do quite often, um, this can get really fiddly. Uh, with having to go through, you know, macro steps and, and adjusting it. But um, yeah, I don't know how useful this is to compare a 43 millimeter cone burr grinder to a 75 millimeter flat burr grinder. But uh, you know, you got to see the decent do its thing. We had some coffee. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Bye.